And so, before our eyes, virtually, in the last century, we have seen evidence of the etheric body disappearing. I like to think of the etheric body of, as something that has existed partly as emotional or astral and partly physical. And that sometimes the emotional and the physical come together, such as in situations of great grief, where there is grief, especially where the grief is national, like the events of September the 11th last year, the year 2001 in New York, like the events of battleships being sunk at sea, like the events of epidemics, especially of um, influenza, causing mass grief and somehow reaching down to physical tangibility. We must also understand that the highest expression of man is of the spiritual nature of what we call Atma, Buddhi and Manas. And these certainly are the tiniest imaginable particles. We, however, are also beginning to recognize these tiniest of particles, these quantum particles, as it were, as having the ability to exist as particles and also the ability to exist as waves. Wave particles or wavicles. And the result of this is, of course, that there is a merging of both the theosophical principles and those of quantum physicists today. The, the borders between the two have evaporated. We are talking about a greater understanding of the nature of man. When we come to the subject of healing, we must therefore bear in mind in our diagnosis that there are various vehicles of consciousness which are affected. In my book, Esoteric Healing Two, I have explained how disease or dis-ease is the result of man being unable to express himself fully. I have compared man and his vehicles to a wind sleeve, such as one sees outside an airport. And when the wind is blowing and the wind sleeve performs its full function, it straightens out and the wind passes through it and its shape is, f is firm. Firm, maybe waving a little, but still firm. And man is very like that. He takes up spiritual fire with its originality, with its meaning, and he expresses it in the world in himself whether it is an art, or truth, or beauty, or goodness, or justice, we express ourselves. If for some environmental or some uh, biological, genetic reason we cannot express ourselves, then we are candidates for disease, dis-ease. And so, when we come to apply the sciences of spiritual growth, the sciences of healing, science behind meditation, the science between, behind serving mankind, we have to recognize certain functioning laws in order to express ourselves. And one of the most important of these is the recognition that we are, ourselves, a wave entity. Because we have so much material and spiritual energy, essences, because we are such 
in such a way constructed, we tend to express ourselves positively and negatively in a wave or sine wave pattern. And it is when we are positive, when we are original and entrepreneurial, we approach the divine. We approach the divine, the realm of Atma, Buddhi and Manas, which interpenetrate each other, and we find ourselves capable of mystical experience. We are able to experience peak environments in which we seem to be carried on high by the mystical expression of Atma, Buddhi and Manas, which does not use what we call form to express itself in. We may register it as form because we have no other training, but they express their energies in what we call arupic states, states rather than form. It is part of the natural process, spiritually oriented, that man oscillates between the spiritual world and the physical world. And my own definition of spirituality is, of course, as you well know, the degree to which you are able to increase the awareness of those around you, as well as your own, is taken as the element of what we call spirituality. You are a spiritual person if you are illuminating others and illuminating yourself. No need to go into costumery of the priest, of the padre, of the father figure, father of the church. Just to understand that you are a vehicle of expression of spirituality and you can do it in the world and when you are doing it, when you are expressing truth, beauty and goodness to such an extent that you are changing those about you, you are being a spiritual person. Part of that spirituality is this oscillation, this oscillation of the sine wave in which we identify ourselves with the one world of spirit and then come out of the peak period into the valley, into the trough and be part of this world in a physical body, in a real structure so science teaches us. In esoteric astrology, we consider this oscillation as being a peak when it is oriented to the mid-heaven. And the mid-heaven in any chart, as you well know, is here, noon, high noon. And in this particular chart, Cancer is in the high noon, in the full light the full light of the noonday sun. And we say in esoteric astrology that when the, the planets have focused more on the nadir, the midnight of the horoscope, the opposite of high noon, we say this diminishes, this diminishes the opportunity for extroversion for expressing oneself in the outer world in the state of form. We say that this nadir coincides with this lack of opportunity to extrovert ourselves, to externalize our ideas. And it can be accumulated under three forces. And the three forces are related to the progress of the moon. There is the moon that we are born with, here in Sagittarius and the third, and that moon is, in this horoscope, placed in the nadir. It's in the nadir of the chart. 
but we also have the process of the moon progressing, in which case it progresses in the clockwise direction. Yes. When you do that, you're pointing opposite to me. Anticlockwise. 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 It, the planets progress in an anticlockwise direction. The planets, as you know, move in an anticlockwise direction, and indeed, this is true of the moon. The moon progresses around the chart. It takes the moon progressing at the rate of one degree a month, about 27 and a quarter or 28 years to progress around the chart. And therefore, we must take this into account. At this particular time of the horoscope of this person, the moon has progressed around into four degrees of Capricorn and is in the nadir. So we have two positions of the moon. Natal moon in 28 degrees of Sagittarius and we have the progress moon in 4 degrees of Capricorn. The nadir is 7 degrees of Capricorn. But there is a third position of the moon. And the third position is the position of the moon that we take from the ephemeris. The ephemeris indicates to us, according to the day that we are referring, the ephemeris shows us how the moon is progressing around the chart in a lunar month. And the lunar month is about 28 days. There are 13 lunar months to the year. So in 28 days, the moon is transiting, what we call transiting the horoscope, in 28 days. And therefore, every aspect in your horoscope is highlighted by the transiting moon, particularly so when it strikes or conjuncts a planet. It lights the planet up, adds to its resonance and its light, and uh, functions in your horoscope accordingly. However, when the moon has transited to the nadir, it can be one of very low response, whereas in any other position the response tends to be higher. It will favor introvert, subjective, depressive experiences. In the horoscope that we have here, a horoscope of a businessman in the United States of America, a survivor of the Vietnam War, we have an example, a very real one, of a single day taken in his life in which his natal moon was in the nadir, his progress moon was in the nadir, and his transiting moon was in the nadir. And on this particular day, he suffered trauma, which in other conditions would be unanticipated. But here, with the depressive nature of his three moon movements, held in the nadir, he suffered from probably the worst trauma available to him. He works for a very large corporate body in the United States, a body that is worldwide and which all of us have partaken some time in the using of their products. He found, discovered, not for the first time, he discovered that he was being trampled on by the executives of his department, Moon's Rule Departments, Moon's Rule Managers. He was being trodden on 
because the general tenure of this huge corporate body was being depressed, depressed by market conditions, depressed by the fact that their products were being rejected for causing damage to the community using them, and because there was a jostling of siblings for power at that time. There was also indication of redundancies approaching, and so this person naturally anticipated as being fairly low down on the pecking order that he might be made redundant, that he might have his salary cut, that he might be edged out of uh, the most interesting jobs, and so on and so on and so on. And so he suffered greatly from this uh, transient period in which the three moons coincided in the nadir of his chart. It's too early to report whether he survived. The main impetus of his uh, fears was directed at Joe Hayes on the other end of the telephone, and Joe was able to comfort him and give him advice on how to conduct himself. And the advice given was not under any circumstances to become emotionally involved, the red vehicle shown here on the, on the, the chart, the illustration, he must not allow his, his astral body to become so agitated and vibrated by the process of being trampled on that it could cause damage to him and mischief, which could be interpreted as a raison d'etre for sacking him. And he therefore uh, carefully listened to the advice and refused to go over the top when he was picked upon uh, by uh, sibling executives more powerful than he. Observing the chart, you will see that the advice given, and the advice given is usually through Libra, who is the intermediary who often is responsible for what you call it when there is working with a trade union and there is a special thing at wow. meetings? Mm. Arbitration? No, it, it, it's when you, both sides agree to give something. There's a special word for it. Compromise. Conciliation? Compromise. Compromise? No. No, it's a special word for negotiation, where both sides agree to give something and there are concessions on both sides. Special word for it. We'll leave it for the time being. In this instance, there was a concentration, as you can see here, of planets in the sign of Libra, which is the intermediary, which in the first house is the advisor, uh, which is uh, strongly suggestive of patience, and the result was he was advised to keep calm, not to lose his uh, bottle, and that in this way, uh, holding the emotions in check, we call it emotional intelligence, he could weather this difficult period of the nadir that he was going through. And he has done this, and we are awaiting results. It's a lovely example. In history, you can find other individuals who have been through crises which have been famous, and a good example is Nixon, President Nixon, who went through the terrible period of being tried by his own uh, 
or the option of being tried by his own um, comrades in, in the House of Representatives and Congress. And he dealt with the situation in what must have been the nadir of his life and to a certain extent the nadir in the horoscope of the United States. A more specific event was September the 11th, the year 2001, when the nadir of the nation was created by a suicidal bomb attack on its trade centers. In Britain, a NADA example would be that of Robert Maxwell, the juggernaut, the man who uh, embezzled a billion pounds worth of pensioners' funds, and also, at a national level, comparable to an American Pearl Harbor, we had our own Dunkirk experience for England. The United Kingdom has got a horoscope. Its horoscope can be inspected and it can be progressed and you will find that Dunkirk is reflected in the horoscope and it would certainly have links to the nadir. And so this is what we have to say is be aware not only that everybody suffers alienation from the higher self and that when there is alienation and people lose their courage and look for comfort or the comfort that is given to those who are bereaved, remember that cancer is the sign of the zodiac in the nadir and cancer is of course the ruler of death and bereavement results from deaths and to know how to comfort people who have been bereaved or who are in, in the act of dying is very important indeed. So when you think of Nader, think of comforting advice and remember the words that we have used in this particular seminar. We're talking about the progressing and the transiting moon. And we must understand that in esoteric astrology, the approaching moon has a slightly different effect on the planet it is approaching than when the moon, the progressing, transiting moon, is moving away from that planet. It's like the Doppler effect, the Doppler effect in which the star that is moving towards the Earth gives off a different color, blue I think, from the star that is moving away from the Earth and gives off perhaps a red effect. The point we're making here is that there is a slight difference and of course as the moon is getting closer and closer to the planet that it is aspecting, then the Doppler effect is stronger and stronger. Just like when you hear the train coming and it comes from afar towards you and it's eeeeee and as it goes past you it fades but in a different note altogether. And it's gone into the other part of the Doppler effect. Well, now, if you've picked that up and understood that, you have a very, very, very valuable attribute to your astrology, one that you won't find in any astrology books in the world. It's up to you to do research work. I can't do it all. It's up to you to do research work and see with each planet what the two Doppler effects have on your situation. There are bonuses to be gained from 
understanding not only the Doppler effect with regard to the moons approaching a planet and its departure from the planet, but also the whole Nader effect. Some people, like myself, have a preponderance of planets below the horizon. And when you have a preponderance of planets below the horizon, and if especially they are well aspected, then it may be more suitable for you to do your most precious work at night. I find that is true for me. And when it comes to spiritual matters, when it comes to the physics of quantum and higher manifestations like cosmo cosmology, I find it better to work at night when there is less chance of interruption. And when you have had a good sleep in the early hours of the night and you are then not likely to be sleepy, but very alert, and you can train yourself in this respect, so that you are capable of night activity. It means that you have to partly reverse your diurnal rhythm. Your diurnal rhythm, di means two, uh, Ernal, I forget what it means, but it's related to the fact that we are night and day people. Our physical bodies, brains, nervous systems, endocrine glands, sensory organs, brains, all react differently according to night and day. We know this to be so true more recently because of the effect of extending the day in what we call jet lag. Jet lag where we take a plane and instead of having a 12 hour daylight session, our daylight, our day extends to 18 hours or 20 hours or even more. This tends to knock out the diurnal rhythm and we must then make adjustments. We find that when, when we want to sleep, we can't. And when, we, when we don't want to sleep, we do. And we feel out of sorts until diurnal rhythm re-establishes itself. Well, it is possible to take such a situation, and if you have a preponderance of nicely aspected uh, planets below the horizon, change the timing of your finest work. After all, you know, most of us can get through the day reasonably well. It's when we want to do something very refined, when we want to prognosticate, when we want to soothe, say, when we want to look into the future, when we want a, a cure or a treatment for a special psychological condition, and we have to do research and, and careful reading. That may require you to have absolute privacy and absolute quietness. And cancer, normally found in the fourth house in the nadir, is the sign of privacy. It is the sign of privacy and it is the sign of midnight and when things should be quiet indeed, and the darkness side of diurnal rhythm in operation at that time. In acknowledging that esoteric astrology should have practical application, we must consider then the field of esoteric healing. Esoteric healing differs fundamentally from orthodox healing and even from holistic health differs in the sense that it uses the technique of signs and symptoms 
to come to a decision as to what remedy to use. We do not, in esoteric healing methods, follow orthodoxy. We follow anatomy as it is taught in medical school. We follow also physiology as it is taught in medical school. But when we come to a diagnosis, we leave the physical body to the orthodox medical profession to deal with. We ourselves use the observation of signs and symptoms of a patient in order to decide what to give them in the way of therapy. I have drawn your attention already to the matter of our interpenetrating bodies. We have seen that there is an etherico-physical body which is shown here in violet, the etheric, and in black outline, the physical body. That is the vehicle that gives most of the signs and symptoms that are obvious. And we therefore treat the physico-etheric body with what are called the 12 tissue salts. These salts have been diluted mildly, not to the extent of homeopathy, and they are calculated to reach all parts of the body very quickly indeed. When you take a tissue salt, you place it under the tongue, and within three minutes of swallowing it, swallowing the dilution of the salt if necessary, within three minutes of swallowing it, it has reached the stomach, it has been absorbed through the wall of the stomach, and is already in all the tissues of the body. It's just as if you were drinking a glass of water with a very light-colored dye in it. The same thing would occur there. The body would receive in every one of its cells, brains, bones, muscles, skin tissues, would receive something of what you have swallowed within three minutes. And that is true of the 12 tissue salts. So its application is instantaneous. And you must therefore realize that if a person has a headache, or feels squeamish, or uh, irritated by some, you can treat it for immediate attention. It will work immediately. Now, we have 12 tissue salts, and we have handed out to you the appropriate chart indicating that these 12 tissue salts are related to, correspond to the 12 signs of the zodiac. And so, for instance, under the sign of Aries, we have potassium phosphate. Potassium easily ignites. Phosphor phosphorus, of course, is highly explosive. These are two fire components which make up the fire sign of Aries. And so there is a correspondence there and they are ideal for the nervous system because Aries rules the brain and central nervous system. And if a person has an afflicted Aries in his horoscope, then it is wise to prescribe the Aries salt for him. And potassium phosphate is ideal for that, where there is a nervous condition related to the central nervous system. And so there is a rationale underlying these 12 salts. And they have been tried and tested, and they work. 
Notice in your chart that the signs and symptoms are listed underneath the salt potassium phosphate and it suggests all nervous disorders, irritability, nervous indigestion, loss of mental and nerve power, neuritis, emotional strain, hysteria. You have a list of conditions there, but you must learn to detect these conditions from the signs and symptoms that your patient manifests. If the patient looks tired, there is an appropriate tissue salt. If the patient has photophobia and must wear sunglasses for some reason, then you must note the symptom and prescribe the salt according to what you have observed. Not because you have heard he has got an, an eye disease, but what you are seeing and assessing in terms of signs and symptoms. And signs and symptoms are what you, you display, you manifest in your behavior. And so you must be prepared when a patient comes to see you or an astrological subject comes to see you to observe very carefully what he is displaying in terms of signs and symptoms because it will tell you very simply without a medical degree how to treat and you will not be intruding upon the anatomy, physiology, orientation of orthodox medicine. <coughs> and so you have here, very carefully, put so that you can read them if you wish, you have the 12 tissue salts chart, and at the bottom, the correlations with the signs of the zodiac. You have the patient's horoscope, which you can have in the other hand, you can see what the horoscope is saying. This sign is afflicted, give me the appropriate salt. And these salts work through to the physical level. That's the important thing here. So that is the method of dealing with the physico-etheric structure. We'll put that aside for the moment. Now we will consider we will consider the astral body, shown in red here, the emotional nature, shown in red, the astral body, and the mental body, shown in green. There are very few individuals, and especially few women, who have strong mental bodies. It's much easier and less energy uh, losing for a woman to experience her stress emotionally. Men can't do it very well. Men do it better mentally with things like worry. So we are subtly different. Some women, some of the finest minds I've known in my life have been women. I knew three professors at the University of Natal who had wonderful minds, but they had spent a lifetime developing them, not consciously, but through their various disciplines. Now the way in which we treat emotional conditions, by that we mean uh, a person who can't rid himself of his thoughts, they keep recurring, is indicated, the way we do it, is indicated by the second chart we gave you, and this is the famous batch flower remedies. They are spread out around a clock face, which means they can be easily located. Their general signs and symptoms are in the outer ring of the clock face, and so with these five or six titles, you can zoom in to the part of the, the clock face which your particular flower remedy emphasizes. 
if you look at the clock face, you will see that it starts off at one o'clock. That's an advantage. It starts off at one o'clock with Rock Rose. And this is for people who are in shock. They've had a shock. Their nephew has been killed in the September the 11th affair, and they're in shock. And to treat this shock, this moment of crisis, where the person is frozen with terror or fear, or is panic-stricken, or is having nightmares, you give rock rose. And it tells you there, quite clearly, you are observing the psychological symptoms of this person in shock. The medical profession might decide to treat the kidneys. That's their affair. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Give them the physical body. But you are interested in treating the person at an emotional level, the astral body, and a mental level. And the way in which you prescribe is according to their psychological symptoms. You will note that the fourth or fifth remedy down, going clockwise, is the flower remedy, aspen. Willows whiten, aspens quiver, little breezes dusk and shiver. Aspen quivers, the aspen tree quivers, and it is the flower remedy for fear. But the importance of it is, and discriminating, is that aspen is the fear of unknown cause. And you say to the patient, yes, you're suffering from fear, but what is it you fear, dear? What is it? I, I don't know. I don't know. I just don't know. I just have this nameless fear, aspen. And if the patient does know what the fear is, then you give them another remedy altogether, which is what, Joe? Mimulus. Mimulus, yes. The mimulus flower <coughs> is for the fear of known origin. And it's a wonderful method of treating according to diagnosis. And by the afternoon, the fear may have gone, and something else presents, impatience. And so you give impatiens, impatiens, the little flower that we love so much in the summer. And there are 39 of these remedies laid out clock face. This is our design. And there is a 40th one, which is called the rescue remedy. And it is a mixture, this one at 12 o'clock, Little Elephant is 12 o'clock on the M25. Did you know that? Exactly 12 o'clock. And we have planes that cross over here, our particular village. So we have an affinity with 12 o'clock, and they have taken the Star of Bethlehem remedy and mixed it with Rock Rose and Impatiens and Cherry Plum and Clematis and made a rescue remedy with it. And so when you have doubts and a person is under stress, they've been knocked down by a bicycle or something like that, you administer rescue remedy. And rescue remedy will do all that you can do under the circumstances. But that does not mean to say that if a person has been wounded or cut himself and is bleeding to death, that you do nothing else except, except give a flower remedy. You give first aid, of course, and you ring an ambulance to get the person treated for hemorrhage, internal or external. The flower remedies are gentle. They have been taken as the dew from flowers which has been struck by sunlight first thing in the morning and collected, and then triturated, and of course mixed, right down uh, to um, 
a, a remedy that is completely safe. And so you see on the chart that people in 90% of instances either present with signs and symptoms which represent fear, here it is, this section here, or uncertainty, or no interest in the present, or loneliness, or oversensitivity, or despondency, or over-concern for others. And it is so very easily easy to go into these sections and then question the subject, question the patient, observe by all means, but question them, and locate the appropriate flower remedy. If you have the horoscope, then you are able to discover the appropriate sign of the zodiac, or you look at the horoscope and say, this sign of the zodiac is afflicted, what flower remedy do I give? I can't see any signs and symptoms, but I know from the horoscope that Scorpio is affected, it's a female, she is likely to suffer from hemorrhagia, if the history confirms it, and there are two little books that carry the 40 flower remedies. And these books will tell you at the outset, Moon in the fourth house, give olive and pine if it is afflicted. Moon in the ninth house, give olive and willow. Moon in the tenth, give olive and gauze. And so you have all the flower remedies with their signs and symptoms related to afflicted signs in your horoscope. These two, these two structures, the flower remedy chart and the book of repertoires of flowers, are calculated to treat the mental and emotional parts of our nature. Some of them and here you have to be not careful because there are no adverse side effects from these flower remedies. But some of these remedies have been found by people to be acceptable as spiritual remedies. When we begin to tread the path, we have disappointment. We feel alienation. And when these occur, we must learn to identify them by keeping a record in our spiritual diary of what flower remedies help us to overcome spiritual setbacks. We don't publish them, we don't, but we all know which remedies suit us best when we are confronted with spiritual setbacks. You know how the batch flower remedies were evolved? They were evolved by a doctor, and the doctor was a pathologist. He was working with dead tissues, human tissues. He was working with all kinds of bacteria and viruses, until he got sick of it. And he felt that this was not the kind of medicine he wanted to give his life to. He was a lover of nature. He went on walks out into nature, the nature of the English countryside, and he came to the conclusion today, watching the sun shining on the petals and leaves of flowers, that as the sun solarized the dewdrops on these structures, that they must be, have special healing capacity. And so he collected first 12, then many more, and finally 39. He collected these remedies and took them himself. He took them, though he was perfectly healthy, he took them and he went through a mediumistic stage in which he went through himself the signs and symptoms that the remedy was best for. And so if it was aspen, he would take it and he would observe carefully what he felt, how he thought, 
what the response of his body was. And so Aspen was given certain factors to him from the subjective world. He recorded them, and that's how Dr. Batch of flower remedy fame came to evolve the 39 remedies. And so we say that the mental uh, signs and symptoms the emotional or astral signs and symptoms you treat with flower remedy. When you come down to the physical body and its etheric counterpart, you use the 12 tissue salts. It's a wonderful, compact pharmacopoeia. If I was starting out, I would, to learn, how to treat friends, animals, racehorses, whatever you like that's ill. I would have a large chart done of flower remedies, perhaps uh, four of these in size, and I would have it opposite me. I would have my patient sit down in front of me. I would question him appropriately. We may do that tomorrow. And at the same time, as he gave a sign or a symptom, I would locate it on the chart behind him and then record it in the case history. And so you are able, through powers of observation, to link esoteric astrology with the most popular form of esoteric treatment that there is. Acupuncture has come and gone in the West, all right, not totally gone, but it is not as popular as it once was. Flower remedies are increasingly popular, and they are obtainable in a compact set, which you can buy from, from who do we recommend, Duke Street? Well, Nelson's. 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 Nelson's and Duke Street, mm -hmm. and uh, you can you can start um, you can start prescribing straight away, and why not treat the dogs and the cats, and the neighbours, and your nephews and nieces, and yourself, until you get confident that you really do help in such matters.